Radio on Sirius XM Channel Lady, plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airways of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. The Stephen A. Smith Show is being brought to you by Barbasol. After 100 years of making shaving cream, Barbasol is finally making razors. Well, that was a no-brainer. Try the Barbasol Ultra 6 Plus today. Save now at Barbasol.com. Plus, ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Quote, buy and save on home insurance with Progressive's new home, quote, explorer. Only at Progressive.com. It is my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line. If he has any decency within his body, which I know he does, he feels just as bad as me, knowing what we're subjected to here. Uh, he's written for the New York Daily News for many, many years, covering the Knicks before he departed to uh, the cover for the cover the NBA for the Athletic. Uh, he also has his own show on NBA Radio, Sirius XM, as well. Uh, and of course, he's an ESPN contributor, uh, primarily to Around the Horn and others. I'm talking about my buddy, a uh, great NBA reporter, the one and only Frank Isola, is on the line with yours truly right now. What's going on, Frank? Man, how are you? Stephen A., the king of South Street, the legend from Queens, the stud in New Jersey. You got everything covered in the New York metropolitan area you know, and nationwide, too. You know what? I wish I did, but I can't say that today because if I had everything covered, I would have made sure the ping pong balls, the ping pong, <laughs> the ping pong balls fell in the New York Knicks' favor and they wouldn't lose out to the New Orleans Pelicans or the Memphis Grizzlies and they would have got Zion Williamson. Uh, could you put into perspective how New Yorkers are feeling right now and how you think they should feel in light of not landing the number one overall pick in this draft. Percent chance of getting the top overall pick. Mm -hmm. Yesterday they only had a 14% chance. And I'm like you, I heard what you said uh, before on first take. When they went to commercial break and the Knicks were definitely in the top four, and I'm thinking, well, hang on a second. If New Orleans is in the top four, Memphis and the Lakers, the Knicks must have the pick because they had the best chance of getting the number one pick, and then you hear Lakers, and you're like, uh-oh, it's going to be the Knicks. And then, of course, the next one was the Knicks. Here's the thing with the draft lottery. You always have to be careful of, you know, getting too crazy about where you pick. A lot of times it's who you pick. And as you know, Kawhi Leonard, Giannis Antetokounmpo, they'll be in the Eastern Conference Finals tonight. Those guys were drafted 15th overall. So the Knicks are going to have an opportunity to select a very good player. It's now up to them to take that good player. And as you know, if we know it's not going to be Zion, but depending on who goes before them, it could be John Moran. It could be R.J. Barrett. One of the things that I'm worried about here, Frank Isola, and I was looking at it from this perspective, even though the Knicks, because I spoke to them this morning, vehemently uh, refute any notion that they were going to trade the number one overall pick if they had a, had acquired it in, a, in an effort to, to acquire Anthony Davis. I'm of the mindset these are the New York Knicks. You never know if you've got that number one overall pick. You know what? You've set yourself up nicely because you can get an Anthony Davis. If there's any truth to KD and Kyrie coming to town, who knows what kind of deal you could ultimately end up pulling off if you've got that asset available to you. But now that Zion is not going to be the number one overall pick and nobody has his value, obviously, in this NBA draft that's coming up. I'm of the mindset we're back to hoping and praying beyond hoping and praying that KD and Kyrie come to New York because it's all we've got right now. How do you look at the landscape, Frank? Uh, I, I agree with you. And I do think whatever people say today, that could obviously change between now and the draft, that first week after the draft and right around free agency. So, of course, no one's going to want to tip their hand. I do think this, though. You could draft desire. If you got the number one pick, I think the fans, the org people in the organization on the business side, Media people, you know, we have not really seen a guy enter the league like this, maybe since LeBron James, but not a lot of people had gotten to see LeBron. We had heard about it. We saw him on the cover of Sports Illustrated. He was a couple of his high school games were on ESPN, but we've seen Zion Williams and the ratings for Duke this season were off the charts. He was like must see TV. So I just think whoever gets the number, whoever would have gotten the number one pick in this case, New Orleans, I just find it hard to believe that anybody would have traded them. Meanwhile, for the Knicks, and I think you're right. Obviously, they're still in play for guys like Kevin Durant and also for Kyrie Irving. But now you look at the roster. The roster was 17 and 65. It's going to get better if you had Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. But Kevin Durant would be leaving you know, the best roster in the NBA, and Kyrie Irving would be leaving one of the best rosters in the NBA to come to the Knicks. So there'll still be work to done. And we know how it works 
with high picks. Everyone gets excited about them, and then the season starts, and you're like, you know what? The kid's only 20 years old. He's only 21. It takes time. And it's the same thing what kind of the Lakers are going through right now. You know, where LeBron is in his career, he's at a much different timetable than what the younger Lakers are, and that's what makes it kind of an awkward fit. And that's why for the Knicks, they got to be careful. you got to make sure you get two of those guys because in L.A. they only got one, so it's LeBron who is in a win-now mode surrounded by guys who are still maturing as players, as people, getting used to the league. So those timetables haven't exactly meshed quite yet. And if I were the Knicks, that's the one thing I would be concerned about. But to your point, if you're getting two of those guys, it's a little bit different. What are we to feel about the New York Knicks at this particular juncture uh, since Steve Mills and Scott Perry are in charge? James Dolan is still running the franchise. He's still the boss. He's still the individual that cuts the checks. You've covered this team for over 17 years. Your publication in New York Daily News has its history with the New York Knicks. You're no longer a part of that publication, but you still know all the ins and outs. I would ask you, what are we to expect from the Knicks with this hierarchy in place compared to what we've seen from the Knicks in recent memory? Well, and that's the thing. You know, everyone is kind of unproven in their current roles and, you know, even the head coach. I do think the Knicks are going about it the right way because I do think that, you know, the one thing about fans, and especially in light of what the Sixers went through, it does seem like fans are willing to be patient with a rebuild as long as they feel like you have a plan. But this is the one thing about these rebuilds. Sometimes a monkey wrench gets thrown into it. You thought, you're thinking, we got the worst record in the league. Yeah, we'll get the number one pick. It hasn't exactly worked out that way. So, again, I think they're going to try to strike it rich this summer. If they don't, we know what their spin is going to be. Well, we're kind of rebuilding. And i got to be honest with you, I would understand that in a lot of ways. So would except I. for the fact that you did trade Porzingis. So if you trade Porzingis and you don't end up with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, then it's like you gave a guy away for something much well, further down the road. Then, you, then you're really all in on a rebuild. Let's stay right there with that particular Chris Stapp's Porzingis trade because here was my understanding of it. About 24 to 36 hours prior to him being traded to Dallas before the NBA trading deadline expired, Frank Isoli basically said to them, look, I want out. Now, if you're not going to move me, then I'm going to exercise the, you know, the, 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 you know, the qualifying offer in my contract. I'll serve one more year. Everybody will know I don't want to be here. That'll make it even that much more difficult for you to move me later on. And on top of it all, I have no intention of signing with you again. I signed my qualifying offer for the additional year, but that's about it. After that, I'm out. And the New York Knicks not only could end up with nothing, but in the summer that they're trying to recruit people to come to the franchise, you'd be busy telling the world that you didn't want to be here and 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 basically saying to others you shouldn't want to be here either. So in light of that reality, that's why they had to trade poor Zingas. That's why they were stuck making sure they let him, let him go, which is why I think they did a good thing by clearing an additional $41 million that's, in cap space. What do you make of that? No, I did I understand why they did it. My point is, if you don't get anybody, now you're thinking, you know, could they have hung on to him, maybe tried to trade him, in, include him in the deal for Anthony Davis? Mm. I understand what you're talking about. But, I, you know, they didn't, they didn't do a good enough job probably nurturing that relationship. But let's also be honest here. Chris Stapps, you know, when he was healthy, is a terrific player. An issue with him was he wasn't healthy, and he could be a bit of a high-maintenance player, I mean, a high-maintenance guy himself. So the relationship was never good. I think once it came out that Phil Jackson was thinking about trading him to the Boston Celtics. I think everything kind of soured from that point on. I do agree with you. I didn't think eventually that he wanted to be there. I understand why the Knicks did it. But again, part of your plan is to make that trade. You open up the two salary slots with the hope that this summer, Kevin Durant is obviously the big, the big fish out there. Can it be Kemba Walker? Would it be Kyrie Irving? They want to add that other guy as well. I think if you do that, then the trade was a smashing success. Frank Isola right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. What do you think about the combo of KD and Kyrie in New York? How does that mix work, or how does that combo work for you? Well, I mean, Kevin Durant's at a different level. I mean, you watch the way that he's played in these playoffs ever since he had that moment where he told the media, you know who I am, I'm Kevin Durant. Mm-hmm. Look at the games that he's had. He had a 50-point game, a 46-point game, a 45-point game. I give the Warriors all the credit in the world for the way that they've played especially the last five quarters against the Houston Rockets. That was like championship-level toughness, ability, everything like that. But offensively and now even defensively, he's just at a different level. The one thing is, 
He's a bit of a flaky guy. I know that you've had some things in the past, and he's very sensitive to yep. criticism. Kyrie Irving is kind of the same way. And I always laugh when, remember when Adam Silver came out during the All-Star game? He said, you know what? My feeling is from talking to a lot of NBA players, they're generally unhappy. And the first two guys I thought about were Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. When you look <laughs> at them, you're like, why would you be unhappy? Both of you guys seem like you're in a pretty good situation. And then you think to yourself, wow, these could be the two guys that come, that come to New York. And it seems like they are unhappy all the time. Talented players, but Kyrie, as you know, Steve, He's got to take a bit of a hit here because last year he did not play for the Cleveland Cavaliers and they made it to the NBA Finals. He did not play for the Boston Celtics in the playoffs. They made it to Game 7 of a conference finals five minutes away from going to the championship. And he was on the team this year and they won five playoff games. Mm -hmm. So he could point the finger all he wants at young guys and at Brad Stevens. He's got to take some accountability as well for the way that the team performed this year. He's the best player on the team. They won five playoff games. But what we hear is that KD wants to play with him. Why do you think a player of KB style, a KD rather, KD style and his magnitude would want to play with Kyrie Irving? I think I think it's just I'm a big time player. You have a big name. We would be perfect together. I think that has a lot to do with it. But I also like if you're Kevin Durant, just know this, Stephen. You know it better than anybody. What you have in in Golden State, don't expect that anywhere else. Mm. You know, you're not going to have Steph Curry. You're not going to have Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and that kind of ownership and that kind of front office. But I think what he's worried about is I do not want to be in the same situation that LeBron got in. LeBron went to L.A. and he's figured, well, somebody will come with me. And they didn't get anybody, at least not yet. Paul mm-hmm. George, we all thought yeah, there was a chance he would go there. When it came time to sign, he, got, he took the most money that he could for Oklahoma City. So I think that's why Kevin Durant, if he comes to New York, he wants to make sure he's coming with somebody. Frank Isola right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. What do you think of Kawhi Leonard and how he's looked in these playoffs and what his free agent options are going to be? He's another guy. He's very unpredictable. He's a flaky guy. I think it helps him in a lot of ways on the court. He doesn't show a lot of emotion. You know, that game on Sunday where nobody else wanted to shoot, and you know Kawhi Leonard is not the kind of guy who wants to take 39 shots in the game, but he said, the heck with it. Nobody wants to shoot. I'll carry us through. And, he, you know, he obviously hit a lucky shot, but he was tremendous. I think he can go to the finals, and I don't know if he's going to stay in Toronto. Toronto is a great city, one of the best sports towns. In North America, well, it's one of the great towns. Of- it's one of the great towns. Period. Let's just call it it's what very, it is. Very, very few diverse. things are more special than Toronto. Yep, very diverse. It's an international city. Very sophisticated city. Got a lot of culture up there. But who knows what he wants? He's hard to predict. We. I don't think we ever thought that someone of that stature, being a Finals MVP, would want to leave the San Antonio Spurs. We weren't used to that. That never happened with David Robinson, Duncan. Even though he talked to Orlando more than, what was that, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Manager Ginobili, Tony Parker in his prime didn't leave uh, San Antonio. So that part, the fact that he was willing to leave there, to me, all bets are off the table. You can't tell me at this point, Steve, and we've seen a lot of crazy things happen over the past couple of years with all the moves that LeBron has made and what Kevin Durant did. You can't tell me at this point you're going to be surprised if he leaves or he stays. I just think it's that up in the air, and he's that unpredictable. Who do you think has the best chance to end up with LeBron James in L.A.? You know what, I, I, I would not rule out Anthony Davis' trade, and I still think there's a chance. I know I've heard a lot of people, I think you have said it as, as well, oh, it's crazy, Kyrie Irving. You just never know. What if they got Anthony Davis in a trade? Mm. Would then would, Is there a way they can get Kyrie Irving? Maybe Jimmy Butler. I think this summer is a referendum on the Lakers, and I'm not going to put it on LeBron. LeBron, you know, I get it. Maybe Kevin Durant doesn't want to play there. But LeBron James has been a successful player in his career. This is on ownership and management there. And, none of, you know, with all due respect to all of them, in their current roles, they haven't accomplished anything yet. I know what LeBron James could do. LeBron James is a great player. You bring LeBron James in, you better go out and get another person. And I had a lot more confidence with Matt. You know, maybe Magic Johnson wasn't involved in the day-to-day, but the free agency stuff. If I'm the Lakers, I get him involved somehow, it's, some it's, way. It's Try to get him to talk to some of these guys and recruit. It's interesting that you bring up Magic because I, find, I saw Magic – praising the Lakers, Kyle Kuzma, Lucky Charm, Jacket, and all of this other stuff, you know, getting them the fourth overall pick in the NBA draft. But if I am a Laker fan, you know, how much do you care or how do you absorb any words of encouragement from Magic Johnson right now, considering the fact that he just walked away from the Lakers as president of basketball operations? And what are we to think about what's been transpiring with the Lakers in regards to Jeannie Buss, Linda Rambis, Kurt Rambis, Rob Palenka? What do you make of that whole situation? Well, but my thing is, I didn't like what Magic did, but then as time has gone on and we've seen 
and some of these stories have come out, it sounds like it was pretty dysfunctional. I understand LeBron being upset, but it's also LeBron. It's not like he's ever given anybody a heads up when he has left. Right. What I thought was weird about it, Steve, was when they were going out to meet with Monty Williams. And according to reports, it was Jeannie Buss, Jesse Buss, Joey Buss, Linda Rambis, Kurt Rambis, Tim Harris, the COO, and also Rob Palenka. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, is Pat Riley, Masai Ujiri, Danny Ainge? Bringing six Archie different people. Buford, are they doing that? Come on. No. I mean, Monty Williams has been in the San Antonio Spur organization. He played for Pat Riley. He's played for Larry Brown. You don't think when Monty Williams sees like a boatload of people showing up, he's thinking to myself, what is going on here? Mm. I, you know that LeBron must be thinking that. Mm. LeBron's at a different stage of his career, but there's got to be a part of him that must be thinking, I wish these guys would lean on me a little bit more because I kind of know what's going on here. Do you think that LeBron James' conspicuous silence as it pertains to who the new coach of the Lakers was going to be, now is in Frank Vogel, Jason Kidd, lead assistant, all of this other stuff, the fact that he has been so silent and sort of let things be, I think it potentially makes the Lakers less appealing in terms of prospects' willingness to join LeBron James in L.A. because he doesn't seem to really have a strong voice over what the organization does. What are your thoughts about that? You know, when the Knicks um, decided not to bring back Mike Woodson, and we talked to Carmelo Anthony about it, and Carmelo Anthony, his voice cracked a little bit because he had a lot of success under Mike Woodson. I think Carmelo Anthony also knew that the reputation was people think that I'm a coach killer. So Mike D'Antoni, I mean, I'm sorry, Mike Woodson being removed as coach, people are going to think that I had something to do with it. And I think LeBron James, he knows what people think about him, that he runs everything. And I think he's thinking, I'm not going to get blamed for this if this goes wrong. If this is what you guys want to do, go right ahead. But I'm of the belief, LeBron James is 34 years old. He's on your team. If you don't look at him as a partner, you're making a big mistake, then you might as well trade him. Because he's got like two very good years left in him. We already saw him suffer a major injury this season. He needs to be your partner. And if he wants Tyron Lue to be the coach, make Tyron Lue the coach. Now, people are going to say, oh, you can't do that. That's unfair. You can't turn the organization over to him. It's, it's LeBron James, mm-hmm. and it's a different stage of his career. This is nothing you, you didn't know before you signed him. Once you sign him, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. And I'm of the belief that uh, Jeannie Buss, and I think that Bill Jackson is somewhere in the background, mm-hmm. probably as an advisor, Kurt Rambis, Linda Rambis, they're thinking, we're the Lakers. We do things our way. You're not going to run the team. So, But we'll make a concession. We'll let Jason Kidd be the assistant coach. So to me, they're halfway in with LeBron James. I think that's the wrong way to do it. Either be all the way in or – Think about trading him because I don't think it's going to work out this way. I think it's a big mistake that they're making. If you were to trade LeBron James, what do you think would be the ideal landing spot for him? I mean, I don't think Houston could get him, but they're kind of in that same. That's my now. that's my selection. It would be Houston. I don't yeah. think they could get him, but that would. Yeah. But hey, listen, here's what here's the thing, Frank. They offered four first round picks for Jimmy Butler. That that's fair, and I think Daryl Morey. You know, the one thing to, to Daryl Morey's credit, Daryl Morey is always thinking about winning a championship. And, you know, my thing about the Rockets, I was very disappointed with what happened in game five and the way that they played in game six. To me, that was a golden opportunity. I'm not ready to say their window is completely closed. And if you went out and got LeBron, it'd certainly be a different story. So I, I could see the Houston Rockets trying to make a play for it. And if you were the Lakers, you got the fourth pick now. You know, why not explore uh, trading LeBron? Maybe you have all these younger players. Maybe just think to yourself, we get it. Maybe we need to... Um, reboot again. Well, let me say this. Let me say this before you. Let me say this before you continue. Let me say this before you continue. Number one, even though he doesn't have a no trade clause, and the Lakers, you know, he doesn't have a no trade clause, so the Lakers can trade him. He does have a fifteen percent trade kicker. You know how that works. Yeah. And so, as a result yeah, yeah. of that, and with the Lakers and their financial issues, that might be a reason as well that they well, wouldn't. Let me ask you this: Do you think that he's there, and he has every right? He's a free agent. He's accomplished a lot in his career. He's thinking about his post playing career. Family thinks he wants his family to be happy and his kids to go to school out there. That's great. Do you think from a basketball standpoint, there's a part of him that regrets making the move that he made? Yes, I really do. I think that from a basketball standpoint, I think LeBron James is in L.A. for quality of life, meaning weather, uh, Hollywood for the, on the business side, and, and you know his family wanting to be. I think that LeBron James is willing to make the sacrifice to do for his family more so than himself, knowing that they would be happier out there and they would be in Akron. But I think for basketball, strictly basketball purposes, I do think that there are regrets. I do think that it's a move he wish he wishes he didn't feel he had to make. That's my personal and that's belief. why. And, and I think you're 100 percent right. And I think that's why he feels some level of betrayal and hurt by Magic Johnson because we know he looks at Magic as an equal. 
a guy who's won before, has been a championship player, what he's done in his after-playing career in terms of business, and I think not having that security blanket there, you can't tell me he's not concerned. And the thing with Tyron Lu, I heard that if Tyron Lu probably would have taken a four-year deal, I cannot get on the Lakers for only giving the three-year deal. You know what? It's a lot of money, three years deal. Why do I have to give you a five-year deal? I don't agree with telling him who to hire as an assistant coach. I think that, you know, they did that to Derek Fisher in New York, and that was with Kurt Rambis and Phil Jackson. And I, let me tell you something, Derek Fisher, I know people laugh, and I mean, Derek Fisher did a very good job in New York. Mm-hmm. And he had the respect of the players, but there were some issues on that coaching staff and still made him hire some guys, and that never works out. It just doesn't. I shouldn't say it never does. Most of the time it doesn't. Let's call it, what, let's call it like it is, Frank Isola. You know me. We all know that the players respected Derek Fisher. I have nothing against Kurt Rambis. I think he's a good man. He's knowledgeable about basketball. But those players didn't have that same level of respect for Kurt Rambis. You and I both know that. Am I correct? No, 100%. Derek had a lot of respect in that locker room, and he was trying to do things his own way. But, you know, uh, Kurt Rambis was pushing the triangle, which was coming through Phil. Phil Jackson trying to coach the team from the 10th row at Madison Square Garden. That wasn't going to work. You know what? If you want to coach the team, get on the bench and do it yourself, and you take all those losses. Mm. So with that being said, circling back to the New York Knicks, because that's where we jump-started this conversation. They don't have Zion. Knowing the Knicks the way that you do, what's the ideal thing for them to do from this point forward? I would draft, try to get, uh, I'm going to keep the number three pick, and I'm going to try to get, hopefully it'll be R.J. Barrett. I have a funny feeling he might have a big, the one thing about John Moran, he's small. I heard mm. him on an interview say he bench presses 145. Mm. Frank, I saw his bench pressing 45, Stephen. <laughs> I, need, I need my point guard to be bench pressing. He's a young kid. He's still going to get stronger. I understand he's done some special things. But I think, remember, coming into the college basketball season, everyone had R.J. Barrett projected as the number one overall pick. So I think a lot will depend on who Memphis takes at number two. You can get a good player at three, and the Knicks have been talking rebuild. So here you go. go what about, Dar- what about Darius Garland out of, Vill- out, of, out, of, out of Vanderbilt? Yeah, see, yeah. He, he looks, when you watch him play, he looks tremendous. Doesn't always scare you, though. Name me the Vanderbilt guy that struck it big in the NBA. That's true. But Steph Curry like, did come from Davidson. You never know I what you'll find. But you know, it's like when they're drafting guys from Stanford and Texas A&M in the NBA. You're like, they never, a lot of times they don't work out for whatever reason. I got Except you. The, uh, DeAndre Jordan. Oh, you right about that. Appreciate you, Frank Isola. Thank you, buddy, as always, man. I'll be All listening right, to you tomorrow you. morning. You're the man. All Thanks. right. The one and only Frank Isola. My buddy, Frank Isola, did an outstanding job covering the Knicks for many, many years. 17 years in New York City for the New York Daily News. Keep in mind that the New York Knicks and the New York Daily News detest one another. And Frank Isola was in the middle of all of that because he was just doing his job covering the team for the New York Daily News, and he had to work through that minefield, a battle that had nothing to do with him and still did the outstanding job that he did all of those years. Plus, now he's at The Athletic. He's got his own show on NBA radio, uh, Sirius XM. Also, he's a contributor to Around the Horn right here on ESPN. He and I go back a very, very long ways. Very, very few people on this planet are more knowledgeable about the game of basketball and the NBA than he is. Proud to call him my friend. The one and only Frank Isola right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. We'll get to your phone calls, back to your phone calls, and more because there's so much to talk about with this draft lottery. So stick around. Don't touch that dollar. It's your boy, Stephen A. right here with ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way. The NBA playoffs are on ESPN Radio, presented by Indeed. Tune in tonight for Game 1 of the Eastern Conference Finals as Giannis and the Bucks host Kawhi and the Raptors. Coverage begins at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on most ESPN radio stations. Also, when you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes. You want an efficient way to get to a short list of qualified candidates. That's why you need Indeed.com. Post a job in minutes. 